Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to what is actually the very first uh, Nutritional Institute webinar. I've done plenty for practitioners, but actually none for lay, lay person. Having said that, there's a few doctors on the line to, to, today, so thanks for joining. We've also got a very mixed uh, lineup of people. Some blasts for the blast from the past. We've got some South, South African um, contingencies and uh, some British. And I just want to mention one special guest today, and that's uh, my mum. So, mum, welcome. Good to see you. And also my mum's friends and some family members. So, great. This has uh, been a actually a, a very big uptake of uh, people. Um, we also got the uh, topic correct. Um, we're in this very strange time at the moment with this world event that's never happened before. Hopefully it never happens the same ever again, but we will see. Um, and we want to kind of um, present a mind-body perspective to your own immunity, um, a message that isn't coming across through the main media, um, something that you can help empower your own knowledge and behaviors with. So just want to quickly introduce us. Um, my background's on exercise and nutrition. Paul's um, is very much in yoga, tai chi, um, Buddhist practices as well. And for a very simplistic kind of setup for today, I've called Paul mind and me body. But if you look very closely, you don't generally see a, a line across the neck, i.e. dividing head and body. Anything that happens in the head or in the mind affects the body and vice versa. Uh, so we work in different ways, but we cross over quite nicely and we, we share clients in that way um, to, to go to a deeper level of health with our interventions. What we won't be covering today is a very detailed response to COVID-19, you know, an examination of the, the virus, because if we were, you'd hear lots of big words like macrophages and neutrophils and phagocytes and not much mention of the whole body. And the whole body or the whole being, the whole individual is how Paul and I work. We, we want to bring a word into this presentation. And that's perspective. Perspective just puts our own life into the context of what's going on around us. It's only important what we can do for ourselves, as opposed to, you know, all the fear messages that we're hear, hearing around us. And if you're on this call today, it's probably because you like the concept of actually being able to do something for yourself. So that's what we'll try and deliver to you. We'll do about just under an hour of material. I'm going to go through exercise, nutrition, and, and stress responses to the immune system. And then Paul will go through various mind aspects uh, and its relationship with immunity. And then we'll hopefully have time for a few questions. We've got a chat box on Zoom. So as we talk, if there's anything that comes up, just pop us a little message on that. Um, if it's relevant at the time, then we can deviate and answer that question. If not, we'll, we'll just try and wrap them up at the end. And then Paul will do a meditation to finish. Uh, so five minutes or so. And then you're very welcome to stay on beyond an hour uh, if you've got questions that you'd like to discuss with us. Okay, so I want you to look at the wording of these uh, newspaper headlines. So these were quite early headlines when the, the lockdown crisis came along. So we've got Boris Johnson battling COVID-19. We've got the South African Minister of Health battling COVID-19 as well. And then, check this one out. What does it do to our body? It's like we have no say in the matter. Um, we want empowerment. So if it does something to our body, 
we want to actually be able to defend our body against it, whatever it is. And it, I think, is a bit bigger at the moment than just the COVID-19. So I somehow seem to have been able to draw a red line across the screen, and I don't know how to undo that. So apologies, guys. Um, I want to take you back 200 years to France, and we had two very, very eminent uh, medical practitioners and scientists at the time. One you will know the name of, part of pasteurization. The other guy, even I didn't know about him until I kind of read up properly recently, uh, Pierre Bichon was actually the person to discover airborne microorganisms. And he went on to understand the relationship between, um, sorry, I'm getting an instruction from my wife. Click on the clear drawing at the top. Uh, oh, can't find that. Uh, sorry, I'll just talk on. Um, All right. Pierre Bichon, yeah, he went on to discover the relationship between the microorganism and our body and our cells. And essentially, there's a, there's a term now called microbiome, and it's the, the, the bugs in our gut, essentially. And he, he essentially, 200 years ago, was discovering the microbiome. And it's our synergistic relationship between the bugs and our body, bugs and our cells. Um, Louis Pasteur, as the story goes, um, stole his work and was proclaimed to be the first person to discover airborne uh, microorganisms. But he didn't really understand that relationship and, and he demonized the, the germ. And he was the better marketer. So at the time, the paradigm became such that we had to kill the germ to be healthy, as opposed to kind of the other way around. We need to be nurturing the germs in our body because actually if we um, got all the germs out of our body, it would be about two kilos lighter. That's how much we carry around with us. So it was termed the germ and the terrain, and that's the relationship that we're talking. We can't do much about the germ. We're surrounded by them, but we can do a lot about the terrain, which is our body. So let's kind of look at uh, potential weak spots, let's say, for COVID. You know, the big thing that kind of gets uh, pushed around is age. So if you look at these statistics, whoa, okay, let's, uh, let's push everyone into hiding more than 50 years old. But if you actually ask people who are in you know, let's call it the elderly age groups, which UK government would say 70 plus, um, you may get some arguments against that. So like my mom, fit as a fiddle, very active, keeps herself in good shape. Um, I was out dog walking this morning and met a lady who I see often, she's 76 in good shape. These people would rather see their grandchildren than, you know, be housed up just in case they get uh, um, effect, infected by COVID. There's more to it than age. What age does is it brings with it more potential for what I call dis-ease, not disease, because that's like a, um, like a prescription, a diagnosis rather. This is, dis-ease is a description and I prefer descriptions of health because it sounds like you can get out of them. So who's actually more at risk of um, COVID, you know, COVID risk? Most of the severe cases have been of people with pre-existing conditions. Okay, so if you get one of these three big ones, you have to be extremely, extremely careful. If you're just in balanced health, then this kind of information is really important for you because there's a lot you can do. It's about empowerment of information of what you can take with you and change um, and then improve your health. And then your likelihood of succumbing to any, you know, dis-ease with infections gets greatly reduced. 
Now, there's a, there's a system approach that links up all of these diseases, and that is called inflammation. So inflammation is underpinning, according to functional medicine and integrative medicine, all of these approaches and any diseased um, effect on the body. Inflammation is a manifestation of the immune system. So when something threatening comes in, like a virus, or it could be um, that your lungs are susceptible to allergens in the air or food or whatever, your body will react with inflammation. So because these diseases have already got a lot of inflammation um, before exposure to any virus, um, when they do, it heightens the inflammation and you get what's called a cytokine storm. And the cytokine storm is actually what's killing people. All right. So we need to get that perspective. Are you in one of these areas? If so, then we, we can actually change health by um, really focusing in on good exercise patterns, good nutrition patterns, good healthy thinking patterns. So what else is this inflammation affecting? So we're starting to get uh, news articles around overweight and obesity. Does that affect it? Yes, absolutely. I've seen reports around a tenfold uh, worse severity of COVID effect if you're obese compared to uh, normal weight. And of course, obesity is a big normal uh, modern problem. Here's, uh, I'm going to pick on Boris a bit today. Here's Boris talking about it. And he's kind of blaming his time in hospital with COVID-19 to his 17 and a half stones. Um, it might be part of the picture, but later you'll see uh, I'm going to add in another thread to that discussion. And then here's an uh, actual research paper bringing in various risk factors. Smoking was in there as well, which is not really surprising. And then the perfect storm, COVID, virus, inflammatory meeting, an overfat inflammatory pandemic. Okay, so what can we control? We can look at the, the health of each person, health of ourselves. We've, we've also got a little bit around autoimmunity coming in. Autoimmune immunity has become a very, very common uh, disease state. And... In my clinic, I'm actually seeing a lot of young, apparently healthy people, so recreational athletes, who are succumbing to an imbalanced health state. And that's to do with their stress levels, their nutrition, their over-exercising patterns. Okay, so talking about exercise, let's go into that. This is my big area of interest for you know, many, many years. So exercise and immunity, this is a, a curve that's been around for a long time. In, in a nutshell, if you're inactive, you've got a slightly raised risk of um, getting ill. A URTI is an upper respiratory tract infection, and it basically is a common cold type reaction to bugs going around. If you're moderately active, it actually massively decreases your risk of uh, getting the infection and also how long you might sit with that. But if you're very, very active, like a serious athlete, it actually increases your risk. This is the same researcher who took 36 previously over, overweight women who either exercised by walking 45 minutes five times a week or stayed in a sedentary group. And you can see that the exercise group had only five days of sickness over a certain period of time compared to 10. This has been replicated again and again. So it's, it's, it's fairly set, a fairly set paradigm now that you need to be moderately active. And I've just, I just want to share a little story here. I saw this American gastroenterologist present once and he said, you know, in the old days when we didn't have cars, if somebody was sedentary, it would be for one of two reasons. Either you're injured or you're ill. 
And both of those scenarios are inflammatory. So by not exercising, your body is naturally going to be in an inflammatory state because at some unconscious level, the body thinks it's either ill or injured, so it has to raise a defense against that. So quite important, we're designed to move, not too little, but not too much. So shortly after I sort of started looking at this area and COVID was kind of getting, uh, you know, quite serious, this little uh, press release came into my inbox and I thought, great. BBC getting some uh, older, older audiences into a daily routine. That's, that's perfect. As I said, we don't need a lot. It doesn't have to be this one hour, five times a week. It can just be 10 minutes can actually make a difference of exercise. And then this is uh, Paul's area, the yin yang. So the ba balance, the hard and the soft, the hot and cold, light and dark. And yang is the hard side. And you see all these very hard sports over here, like CrossFit, which is crazy popular in uh, Johannesburg. You get triathlon, which is also crazy popular. On the flip side, you've got yoga, Tai Chi, all the restorative type practices. And both are relevant. Um, but I actually, I think this middle ground is very underlooked. So just taking your dog for a walk, going for a cycle in the countryside, going for a, lent, a gentle run, just being, just being active, moving, moving every day. So as I said, too much exercise of the wrong type at the wrong time might most likely will be bad for us but the right amount of exercise at the right time will be good for us. Um, I, I wrote a paper earlier this year, which was looking at the cardiovascular effect of exercise. And actually serial marathon runners are a much higher cardiovascular risk than just generally active people. You know, we think of them as fit and healthy, but actually they, they can be damaged in their heart by doing so much. Okay, so let's go into some nutrition. I talked about the microbiome earlier. If you, apparently, according to somebody, I don't know who said this, but if you take your gut out and lay it on the floor, it'll take up a tennis court. So it's a massive, massive area of immune surveillance. So it's been estimated by a lot of people that about 70% of our immune systems in or around the gut and this is a little diagram for, from my book, looking at on the left-hand side, a healthy cell where you get nice these finger-like projections for lots of absorption of nutrients coming through. On the right-hand side, these fingers are, are really blunted like they've been sanded with sandpaper. And then there's gaps between the cells. So this is called leaky gut syndrome. And leaky gut syndrome leads to a lot of inflammation on the gut level. And inflammation on the gut level, guess what? It, it projects out to the whole system. So it puts the whole immune system into an inflammatory state, which we've already talked about is not a particularly good thing to have. Then we'll move on to some specific foods. Um, so sugar. I uh, just want to share a little story about my mom. Hopefully she won't mind. I was once home for a few days and my mom was sick. She was in bed. So I went upstairs to see her. She was sitting there sipping a, a bottle of um, Lucozaid Sport. I said, Mom, why are you drinking that? Oh, I've heard that you need to keep your energy up when you're ill. Well, unfortunately, how wrong could she be? Sugar is a is a absolute antagonist to the immune system. So I just want to read something out from uh, Linus Pauling, who is the guy who did lots of research around um, around vitamin C. So he said, at the time of a cold, vitamin C helps blood uh, white blood cells in the body to combat the common cold. He also found that sugar caused a 75% drop in the ability of white blood cells to engulf bacteria. Simply put, elevated sugar restricts vitamin C from entering the blood, uh, white blood cells at a time when vitamin C is in high demand. So yeah, first thing you can do, 
get off the sugar and your immune system will go up strongly. Okay, I've been talking a lot about inflammation. This is a handout I give to clients and you've got kind of detrimental food and beneficial food. Anything man-made is in the detrimental section and mostly nature-made food is going to be beneficial in terms of anti-inflammatory properties. Um, just looking at the stuff on the left-hand side, like red meat, if it's like free-roaming venison or game in South Africa, it's going to have a much less inflammatory effect than say it's a um, feedlot cow that's been fed genetically modified maize, antibiotics and growth enhancers. So your, your sourcing is really, really important with this. So the context of the information is important. Um, and then chocolate, you'll see later that co cocoa is good for you or cacao, the natural cocoa form, but it's on there because most chocolate is high in sugar. And then on the next list, this is a little diagram from uh, Rachel in my book. And it's basically the essential good, bad and ugly aspects of oil. So in South Africa, we've had this banting, low carb, high fat movement for a number of years. What they failed to tell us is the differentiation of the different types of fat. So mostly more unsaturated fats like nuts and seeds and fish oils tend to be on the good side saturated fat, too much red meat, too much dairy, especially from, uh, you know, very commercial sources can be on the bad list. And you'll find mostly the man-made oils on the ugly list, like margarine and processed oils and so on. Okay, so let's move into antioxidants. So everyone knows that vitamin C is good for the immune system. Um, there's actually a little phrase you can use just to remember this, uh, ACE, A-C-E. So vitamins A, C, and E are all good for the immune system. So that's if you're doing a, a supplement approach. But the good news is you can get them in a lot more varied form and lots of other stuff in food. So foods, so vitamins and minerals are called uh, micronutrients, but you've also got phytonutrients. So I'll give you a few examples. So berries is one. Um, and just think about color. If you've got color in nature, you're getting good antioxidants. Then you get spinach, any leafy greens, sweet potatoes got beta carotene in it, green teas got catechins in it. There's your chocolate. They're very high in polyphenols. But you need to be on that, that really dark side, the dark lint like 80% or the green and black sort of thing. Oranges, vitamin C, but you've also got uh, all the citrus family. You've got kiwis, you've got peppers. They're all high in vitamin C. And then botanicals. I'm just going to bring these on. And what I want you to do is just test your own knowledge and, and just make a mental note of, okay, what was that? All right. Here we go. And the first row is stuff that you should have in your kitchen already. Okay, so we get garlic, ginger, turmeric, and cayenne. They're all highly anti-inflammatory and they have antiviral botanical effects. The second row is what you might have in your herb cupboard or even better, your herb garden so it's nice and fresh. Okay, here we go. Test your knowledge again. Yeah. So we get oregano, thyme, sage, and rosemary. And then the last one is stuff you can find wild. Although the first one, you'd have to be a very brave thief to get it. But propolis in, in bee, in, in honey, is, is very anti, uh, antiviral in nature. And then I'm picking on my mom today, but this is a really good example. Elderberries are found, uh, found wild in the UK, and my mum makes uh, wine out of it. That's brilliant. It's great. High in antioxidants. And then nettles. Nettles are high in vitamin C. OK, 
Okay. Now, if you want to kind of get into the supplement side of things, which can, I put them at the peak of the pyramid, you, you need to build your base of health with food and daily practices. But supplements do have their place. And I, for one, if, if there's stuff going around, I'll be, I'll be getting onto one of these. So these are like my three favorite herbs. Andrographis, astragalus, and I already mentioned echinacea. So echinacea is quite a common one, very powerful, but you get different strengths of it. So try and get uh, a nice strong one if you can. And then vitamin D. So vitamin D's had like 10, 20 years of research in the immune system. Um, and it's very prized now that we need to hit good vitamin D levels. And even in medicine, that's recognized now. So this research study uh, kind of blew my mind. This is a recent one. Uh, it's looking at COVID-19 severity by vitamin D levels. So you've got the red is very low vitamin D levels. Orange is kind of mediocre. Green, you're in the okay range as far as a lab test goes. And you can see the critical, severe, ordinary, and mild symptoms around COVID-19. So guys, if anyone ever offers me a vaccine for COVID-19, I'm going to say, no, thank you. I'll just get some vitamin D supplements. Thank you very much. Because, <laughs> you know, look at the strength of the effect of that. Hopefully this is uh, replicated and, and really looked at uh, seriously, and I'm sure it will be. Okay, my last little section. And that's looking at stress and the immune, immunity. So this is from uh, Dr. Pr Patricia Warby, who I inter-refer some clients from. She's in, in England. So it's a very strong statement around our emotional health linking to our body. And I just want to do a quick pause here and just ask the question, what is health? because people have different perceptions of that. So I can stand up here and say, right, um, I'm slim, I'm definitely that, um, I'm fit, reasonably, um, I eat really healthy food, and I talk a good game. And so does my wife, Rachel. So we might be what you'd consider healthy, but we are both highly driven A-type personalities that push our careers hard and we're very hands-on parents, meaning that the total load in our life is very high. So stress is actually a killer. So we've both had experiences where um, we've had some flu that we've had needed an intervention to come out of. Um, after that, it wasn't antibiotics. Um, but yeah, we needed a bit of help. So if you're in a very compromised state because of stress and say COVID-19 comes into your life, okay, you might have a worse ride. And I'm going to go back and pick on Boris Johnson again because on the outside, he looks like a fairly healthy guy. Yeah, he's got a bit of a, bit of a tummy. Yes, he's blaming his rough ride on obesity. But can you imagine leading a country at this time and the, taking the burden of responsibility on your own shoulders to make those decisions. So I think stress was a massive factor for him and many other people who apparently on the outside are healthy, but might be in, under a lot of stress. And just in case you're a skeptic and you, you still think there's a, a line across our neck dividing our head and our body and our mind can't possibly affect our body. I read a book years ago by Pat, uh, sorry, Deepak Chopra. And he talked about a study that found neurotransmitter receptors on white blood cells. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. So what we think, obviously that's our neurotransmitters, affects our immunity. And then, so just in case, I went and looked for some research. So stemming from the 1990s, we had actually whole journals dedicated to neuroimmunology. The bigger field we call psychoneuroimmunology. Psycho is what we're thinking. Neuro is the, our nervous system mm. and then our immune system. And here's a, uh, here's a recent one. 
So just look at the wording of this. So lymphocytes is one of these uh, fancy words for one of the immune markers. And then almost finished. This is an amazing lady in the UK who she's a psychoneuroimmunologist. She came up with this very, very simple, she's got an incredibly complex mind, but she came up with this very simple model of the total load of stress. So the three Ps. And when we talk about stress, we think of the top component. But actually, if you're doing too much exercise, as you've seen, that can be a body stress. And any physiological imbalance, like insulin resistance or hay fever, or you're getting a cold, will affect this as well. So let's throw in a stress. And the stress will actually push down your physiological reserve. In other words, you have less capacity to rev up the immune system to any threats that come into your body. So quite, quite simple, but potentially profound. Okay, and then just to kind of back this up, this uh, kind of review study of the relationship between stress and immunity. And it's a three-way street here. Our disease, disease is very influenced by the immune system because the immune system is, is everywhere and affects everything. And a lot of the disease, as I said, is inflammatory in nature. So it's a strong connection and stress directly affects both of those. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish my section with, um, with a quote you've already seen. And it was actually my, my brother who shared this with me and I'd seen it years ago. It's a lovely little quote. So let's focus on looking after ourselves because we can do that. That's within our control. But whether COVID comes around or not, that's not really too much in our control. At some point it eventually will because these kind of viruses do their rounds for, for years, not just months, years. So at the moment we're just trying to kind of allay the effects of it. But um, yeah, we still need to keep our immunity uh, strong for months and years to come. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna pass over to Paul. Okay, thank you so much, Ian, that was fantastic. And uh, welcome everybody. It's a great privilege actually, honor to address and uh, share from my perspective some knowledge and background. Um, and yeah, I hope I can pick up nicely on some of the points that Ian has uh, been discussing there. So yeah, we in this COVID-19 situation and we look out across the global landscape and what do we see? Uh, waves of fear and stress and um, sort of panic and pandemonium and uncertainty. And uh, some people have lost their businesses impacting our social isolation, economic. And it's just really, as we all know, it's really quite horrible. Um, so I kind of like feel, okay, um, what's the, the sort of opposite of that or what, what's the counter to that? And uh, that's where I came up with uh, harmony and balance. And we'll see how that works as we go along. So um, harmony and balance would be, um, let's just say um, uh, harmony and balance would be peace and joy. That's deep fulfillment in life. Um, deep meaning in life, um, optimum health, so strong immunity, good health. Uh, right at the time when we really need our immune system and our health to be strong and, and we have this fear and stress and anxiety that um, absolutely impacts into that um, immunity and health. So um, I think just at this junction, I, I was thinking the, the kind of pivots, uh, the, the essential understanding and, and perception that we need to accept and, and sort of take on that will make this whole presentation make sense is if we pick up on what Ian was talking right at the beginning, and that is um, personal transformation. Well, you know, what can I do in my life, even right now, uh, this 
personal upliftment and transformation. And if we, if we think about that, we all know if, if I go down, I, take, I, I tend to take down the people around me. If I pick up myself, if I uplift myself, um, I uplift the people around me um, in any way what that is. And that, of course, ripples out to um, our communities and society and hopefully eventually globally. So kind of coined a little phrase there of um, a quest for personal transformation. And um, what we're wanting to transform is, the, is the, the fear and anxiety and stress into peace and joy and the isolation into friendliness and warmth and, and uh, um, um, we're actually quite good at those, you know, on a social set, uh, sort of sense, usually. We're quite good at the warmth and the friendliness within our circles of friends and, and, and so on. Maybe it's time to think of how to actually extend that out a little bit further. And of course, it's going to come down into the uh, health and the immunity area as well. Okay, so, so where I'm coming from... Uh, spend most of my life actually involved with yoga. I teach, I run a school, and I've also had quite a lot of interest in um, sort of related philosophies and disciplines and Buddhism and so on. So it's just thinking uh, kind of historically, um, all the, the masters and the sages and the saints, they've all basically more or less said the same thing, kind of panacea for all the human ills. Um, John Lennon from the Beatles actually said the same thing. And my partner also says the same thing. And that is love. Love is the answer. Um, so even in a COVID-19 situation across the globe. Now, I personally tend to maybe shy away a little bit from that word uh, love because I, I kind of feel uh, that it means many things to many people. And it also sometimes is a bit glib. Uh, it's a kind of a bit of a superficial, you know, all we need is love and then, um, you know, whatever. And then nothing really changes very much. Nothing, you just carry on. Now, I completely agree. And I think love definitely is the answer to many, many problems and ills and situations. Uh, but I, what I'm hoping to do here is give us sort of unpack it and, and give us tools uh, that are practical, uh, that we can actually translate um, um, and, and sort of in that quest for transform, personal transformation and upliftment. So coming from spirituality, um, let's say uh, commonly understood as, as sort of body, mind and soul. Uh, and the, the, the important thing there uh, is that we need unity. So unity of, of body, mind and soul. Um, body is quite easy to understand, really. We live in our body. We, um, you know, we look after our body. It's a good vehicle for the duration of our lives. Uh, it's a family of systems. So, uh, you know, we have the digestive system and the respiratory system and the cardio system. And if they're all working together nicely, if there's that harmony and balance, if there's that unity, um, we kind of happy chappies and are healthy and strong. Um, so that, that unity of body, mind, and soul is really important. Uh, mind, okay, so, sorry, I just forgot the five senses there. Uh, obviously, we translate everything that we, all our perception and understanding gets translated through our five senses. So just, just getting on to mind, um, first thing that crops up for most people is conscious and unconscious, which is great. Interesting there, uh, the scientists tell us as well, of our total mind, our conscious mind is something like 5 to 7%, which is really quite a scary little small amount, uh, considering that we don't actually really know that much about the unconscious part of the mind um, or the subconscious part of the mind. The other, another aspect of mind that we're very familiar with is the, is the ego mind uh, and that is the, the sort of sense of me, myself, and I. It does tend to be uh, a little bit small-minded, as it were. Uh, it's quite personal, my name, my personal history, who I think I am or believe I am, what I believe I am. Um, ego mind. Then we've got reasoning mind, 
which is uh, it's, it's basically rationality and logic. It's the mind of reason. We associate that in our heads and so on. Now, the, the one that tends to get forgotten about or pushed away to the back and maybe ignored or not looked at is what, especially in the East, they're much more uh, familiar with this wisdom mind that's going to be so important for what I'm speaking about now. And the wisdom mind is found in the heart. It's not in the head. The wisdom mind is found in the heart. And uh, very interesting there, uh, um, scientists have recently, quite recently discovered that the, the heart, the physical heart, has its own little brain. Um, it's, uh, they, they found something like 40,000 uh, little brain cells that they called neurites instead of neurons. And they found that this brain in the heart can think and make decisions independently of the brain in, in, the, in the head. Fascinating. The wisdom mind uh, is, is the intuitive mind. It's, it's the mind that sort of simply knows. And we're gonna, I'm going to have a very good example to share with you in a moment. But it's the mind that knows without needing the corroboration from uh, the intellect and so on. It's the, the wisdom mind, the intuitive mind, the mind that knows. Now, this is really so important. I'd like to just go a little, little step into this. Um, uh, this is a, 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 li a life story from my own experience. This many years ago, um, I had three clients, all um, uh, sort of high power business people, very successful business people, two guys and a lady. And this was, this was many years ago in the time when the RAND was a lot stronger. And all these uh, scams and so on and so forth weren't anywhere near as virulent and vicious as they are nowadays. Now, of course, cut the long story short, the two guys, and they're all sort of friends, business associates, the two guys get involved in um, some kind of a scheme. And it, of course, it looks completely legitimate and they can't, you know, just, uh, hook, line and sinker, they, they get taken into the scheme, can't find any loopholes. And what's, what's worse is it really seems to be working. I think it was something like six months went by. Uh, so moderate investments, getting a lot of returns, international currency coming in from those investments. Now, the lady was never interested. She was just not interested at all. They actually offered me, and for whatever reason, I also wasn't really involved, wanting to get involved with that. Okay, so six months or so, uh, Gent A, now I'm not making this up, this is a true life story, he loses 12 million rand overnight, gone. Male B loses between six and seven million rand overnight, lucky he didn't have uh, a wife and kids and so on. Um, took him out completely. And well, the lady, hmm, kind of smiling, maybe smoking a little bit, I don't know. But you know, the thing is, why? Why was she never in, uh, interested? And we all know that the ladies uh, are more plugged into the intuitive mind. Ah, well, the reason is very simple. That wisdom mind was close, close by. It was a go-to reference for her uh, in business. So I hope that gives us a nice little view that wisdom mind, the intuitive mind, the mind in the heart that is actually really so absolutely vitally important. Let's go on to soul. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on soul. Um, we've covered a little bit around the heart. Um, there's a, uh, so that's our subtle feelings in the heart. Um, there was a, a French philosopher um, has a very famous quote, that's Blaise Pascal, and he said that the heart has its reasons, of which reason, obviously in our head, knows nothing. The heart has its reasons, think of that little small brain in the heart, of which reason, rationality and logic, knows nothing. Um, spirit is also part of soul. Uh, so for me, soul is heart and spirit. And uh, spirits, spirit is, uh, can be expressed, usually, usually understood as something invisible, 
um, something sort of that's driving at the back there. We can think in terms of, of tenacity, qualities like tenacity and courage. Uh, maybe vision is an aspect of spirit. So soul is heart and spirit. Um, the Italians have a lovely word, gusto. It says a lot that um, uh, sort of, uh, we all know a kind of dead duck type of person or somebody who's vibrant and has a lot of spirit and soul and heart. All right. So now we, we need to basically look at a very quick uh, sort of makeup of what a human is. This is really a constitution, but um, I want to keep it very simple and accessible and easy at this stage and level. So I'm going to use the body as a, as a rough model uh, that we can refer to. In our head, we have thoughts. Uh, we're all familiar with the internal dialogue that goes round and round the chatter in our heads. Uh, often that dialogue can be very uh, negative, can be quite destructive and uh, not very nice, uh, can be very irritating. There are more constructive thoughts, of course, uh, which is a slightly different class of thoughts, but thoughts in the head. And then we also have intentions in the head. Now, um, intentions really, purposes and intents. So it's, it's a kind of an amalgamation a little bit of our desires and our, um, our motivations, intentions. So thoughts and intentions in the head. If we move to the middle of the body, uh, we have, uh, well, we've covered the heart quite a bit now. So we have the subtle feelings rising in the thoughts, like something's not quite right there, it doesn't feel right, or yes, that feels excellent. But now down, and, and interesting, uh, Ian spoke about the, the gut. Uh, we have emotions rising up from the gut. We're all familiar with, the, with emotions. That's the strong energy. And of course, with our COVID time, we have all the fear. Uh, we have maybe some anger, fear, strong energy, energy, emotion. So energy in motion. Hate and love are very strong emotions, strong energy. Uh, joy is also an emotion, so anything with very strong energy. And it's also come through uh, quite a lot in recent years that when we live, in other words, ongoing, when we live by those emotions of stress, that Ian was talking about the, the stress and the A-type personalities and so on, the, the, the sort of ongoing excessive levels of cortisol, hormones of stress, it absolutely negatively impacts into our immunity and our, our general physical health. And, and the flip side of that, they've actually shown with some studies, uh, if they take somebody who has a depressed immunity and, and sort of physical system, and they put them in an environment of caring and kindness and wisdom, uh, uh, general health and immunity, immunity tend to come up very quickly in something like three to four days, we can see a, a very dramatic turnaround. So living by the hormones of stress or living by uh, sort of joy and uh, warmth and friendliness and caring and kindness and those good things. Um, so we're not quite finished. We need uh, uh, something that translates immediately and directly into our physical um, sort of environment, our physical world. And that, of course, is physical actions. Just prick your finger and you will know exactly uh, it's very immediate, it's very direct, physical actions. So that's a quick makeup of what we are. And the caveat there, of course, is that uh, if we're going to be reaching for that harmony and balance, if we're wanting to transmute the fear and anxiety into, into joy and peace and deep fulfillment and meaning in life, we need to have uh, what's the lovely word these days, coherence or unity. So it's the coherence of our uh, constitution. If we have the head going in one direction and my heart going in another direction and my physical actions in another direction, three different, what do we have? We have fighting. We have fighting inside ourselves. We don't have that unity, that coherence. When everything's lined up, our thoughts and intentions, feelings and emotions and physical actions, it's, 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 it's absolutely, it's quite difficult to not have harmony and balance and, and reap the, the rewards of those good things. Okay. Um, the challenge is facing us. 
Uh, we've really basically covered that, but just a, a quick recap. Um, if, if we look out across that, that, that scenario of global scenario of COVID-19, this fear, we want to transform you know, our quest for personal transformation. We want to transmute or transform fear into security and anxiety into peace and happiness, isolation into warmth and unity and friendliness. We all know that when we work together, uh, if, we, if we're in harmony, working together, we're strong, we whole, and of course, low immunity to high immunity, generally low health to higher health. Um, we need to get to our tools quite quickly now. So we need sharp, um, effective tools. And I've selected, sort of uh, made a little selection there for us. So mindfulness, non-attachment and wise choices. There's a little bit, uh, I, I've, I've actually put the, the third one onto the next slide as well. It's really one of the tools, which will be a daily mantra. Mindfulness uh, is really from that, that sort of lovely Buddhist practice uh, where um, just keeping it simple again, we're aware, we're awake, uh, we're fully conscious with our decisions, whether they're small decisions or big decisions. And, um, you know, no hamster wheel here, no, no kind of, uh, you know, um, just sort of mindlessness, hamster wheel, autopilot. Uh, we want to be aware, we want to be conscious, fully conscious, wide awake. Now, there's another aspect to mindfulness, of course. Um, it can be described as a, as a part of an aspect of our experience uh, as we go through our experiences in life. There's a part of our awareness that is observing, that is observing from the outside, almost detached. And the big caveat with that is that it's observing uh, with non-attachment. Now, non-attachment, uh, let's break it up. Uh, one into two, two sort of steps there. Um, no judgments and no um, identification. So there's a part of us that's observing experience from a very neutral place. What do we do all day? We judge. This is good. This is bad. I like this. I don't like this. And it's always from our uh, sort of frames of reference and our belief systems and so on. So it's actually a great relief. It's, a, you know, we can rest for a moment, have, a, have some peace, this neutrality, no judgment. And it almost leads, uh, sort of leads very naturally into the no identification, non-identification. And that's the non-attachment idea. Humans are creators. We're all creators. And that's a good thing. However, when we identify with our creations, we are potentially setting ourselves up for a fall. Uh, I've got my, if I, if my self value and my self worth in life is dependent on my bank balance, if it's dependent on uh, the, the circles that I mix in my friends, if it's dependent on the car that I drive, if it's dependent on the, um, uh, uh, my status and accolades and achievements, those things are transient. They come and go. Um, so I, I need to, 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 to make sure that, I don't identify with my creations. I don't even identify with my body. My body can, you can cut parts of the body off and I'm still here. And we say that that is, um, we say that that is sort of conditional um, uh, self value. Uh, my, my, my self value, my self worth, and this comes up time and time again. It's contingent on uh, a, a conditional thing out there. The, the kind of or the brand of self value that we need is unconditional self worth, unconditional self value, which we're going to find when we stop identifying with every, all these things. And that is just simply because uh, I'm, uh, it's an intrinsic value. I, I get my value from my beingness. It's not, it's not dependent on uh, my successes or failures and comings and goings in the external world of experiences that we're always all going through. Um, I had a, um, well, uh, I don't know if it's funny or sad. I think it's probably more on the sad side, but it was earlier this week, another little example. Um, it was a headline that I saw and it said something like mega millionaire, uh, 
buys in one day a new Porsche, a new Ferrari, and a new Lamborghini. And I kind of thought to myself, whoa, hang on, uh, what's going on here? Um, mm, you know, there's people out there that don't have food. And it just sort of seemed like something's not quite right here, a state of mind, maybe sort of a bit panicky. Where do we get our value from? Is it, is it wise? Is it a wise thing to do? Okay. Um, now, um, so that, that really important uh, third uh, sort of main tool, which is the daily mantra. Uh, so, so we can skip one more slide here. Uh, so that, that daily mantra. Now, um, this is not a mantra. <clears throat> excuse me, to chant 108 times and suddenly everything is going to be okay. No, uh, we can put it on our fridge and get that reminder, but I'd like this to be uh, a mantra. It's a go-to reference. I'd like us to think about this and, and, and dwell, contemplate deeply into it. What does it mean? And what does it mean for me? And how can I, how can I use this? How can I employ this? I took this from a lovely Buddhist prayer, and the prayer goes something like, may all beings, uh, and then the part that I really want to focus on here is uh, attain caring and kindness, empathy and compassion, wisdom and freedom. Say that again. So caring and kindness, empathy and compassion, wisdom and freedom. And again, we're going to see how that, that plays out in a moment. I actually need to start tying up a little bit now. So uh, we're going to look at what is really going to work if I can actually get this, this level of, per, of quest for personal transformation to actually work. In my daily life, uh, what is really going to work? Again, looking out across the, the global scenario that we're faced with and the fear and the stress and anxiety and isolation and so on, uh, so if I, if, I, if I look out and I see, uh, it's actually not that new. It's been around for a long time. And I think what COVID-19 has done is it's actually intensified a lot of stuff that was there already. Um, I see power that abuses. Um, I see power over people. I see power over environments, abuse of power. I see a lot of separatism, division, um, and, and, uh, and, and look at the isolation in terms of separatism and division, as opposed to unity, which is towards working together and warmth and friendliness. Um, and, and intrinsic value is it's, it's just unheard of, really. We, we get our value from our achievements and our successes and, and all that. So it's all conditional type of value. So if we can get this personal transformation to actually work properly in our daily lives and get this, this quest going, uh, uh, when I reach for that mantra, uh, caring and kindness, empathy and compassion, um, wisdom and freedom to inform my small decisions, uh, medium and big decisions, am I going to reach for abuse of power? No, most probably not. I'm going to reach for the kind of power that uplifts, the kind of power that unifies, the kind of power that benefits the whole. And this is the kind of working together and the unity that is going to take that, that warmth and unity and friendliness and, and really spread that out into our communities and into our society. It's got to start with us, of course. Um, so the separatism and the division and, uh, will give way to that, that unity. Um, the abuse of power will go, give way to power that uplifts. And of course, of course, we're going to start moving towards, um, um, you know, uh, higher immunity, uh, general health, uh, higher level, living, start living by the hormones of joy and peace and harmony and balance and, and so on and so forth. Um, it's a funny thing. What, what we focus on tends to grow. So we focus on, we're vibrational beings. We, we're beings of frequency and vibration. 
we're focusing on the fear and the anxiety and the stress, the calamity and all that. You know, we feel we feel more and more stressed, and we start lining up with that, and uh, it sort of grows, and that's what we're looking at. It's actually a choice. Uh, we have a lovely thing in yoga. It's a it's a concept called abhasa, which is which is actually choice. It means practice. We practice choosing for stable tranquility within ourselves. So if I turn my eyes and I'm looking more at the caring and kindness and the unity and the and the warmth and the friendliness, those start start to come up, and I start lining myself up, and the other side just tends to to sort of uh, diminish a little bit and move away, move further away. Um, so I think I think that that basically sort of more or less ties up what what we wanted to say here with this presentation. Um, and I'd like to just finish with a uh, a nice quote by Thomas Merton. He was a Christian uh, sort of commentator, <clears throat> and. Um, um, not sure if he was actually a preacher, but he was a writer and a commentator. And he said, love is our true destiny. However, there's a, um, we're going to find that in togetherness, not in uh, separatism and isolation. We do not find the meaning of life by ourselves, but together. I hope you've enjoyed that little discussion there. And it's been some food for thought and the perspective as well and some tools that we can take up. Um, I'm, I'm going to, uh, well, I think we're going to go back to Ian now for a little bit of a question session. And uh, then I'm going to return later to actually take us into a very short meditation uh, where we can actually sort of experience right here in, this, in the webinar, right here, right now, just a, a way of centering and calming and quieting, but specifically into that wisdom mind. It's really so important in the heart, which is the seat of, of uh, true love and wisdom and caring and kindness and compassion. And so, Thank you so much. So. Um, I think for, for time, Paul, uh, let's go into the meditation now. And um, any questions, if, you, if you've got the time to hang on, we can go into our Q&A session after the meditation. If you don't have time to hang on, drop us a question in the chat box or send me an email and then we'll get back with the, some Q&As when I send an email later because I'll send out uh, a link to the recording as well. Okay, Great. back to you. Great. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, what I didn't mention is that I sort of done quite a lot of music in my life as well, sacred music. So I'm actually going to play some uh, singing bowls for us as well. But um, we'll just see how that works as we go. Um, so I'd like to invite us really uh, to just join together with this a lot of people uh, have a, a bit of a misunderstanding of what meditation is really. Uh, if, you, if you look at the Tibetan word for, for meditation, it means to become familiar with, to become familiar with whatever that is that we're focusing on. And that picks up with, you know, do we focus on the stress and fear or do we focus on the uh, sort of warmth and caring and kindness? So we can sit straight, you can sit in a chair, you can sit on a cushion or on the floor, just keep the back straight. Uh, you don't have to close your eyes, you can uh, just be comfortable. I've got a lovely technique which I like to use often and that is called inner smile. Uh, we all love to tell jokes and laugh because it makes our body feel better. We release uh, the nervous system when we smile. So give yourself a smile. Um, it's a kind of internal smile. The eyes and the mouth are smiling. And you can feel immediately how the nervous system releases and the body relaxes. Breathing. Breathing is calming if you breathe quietly, smoothly, and gently. Breathe. Uh, just keep it simple and keep it easy. So our breathing always needs to be calm and quiet and easy 
and it's a focus. We can just watch our, our breath a little bit. So that combination of smiling and breathing and also just to be here now fully, completely. So the mind tends to drift off into the past and future. So just hold a gentle focus on the here and the now. And then we want to, we want to get straightly involved into the heart. So we all have uh, either a person that we love be careful. Uh, maybe it's a pet. Animals tend to, to give us a lot of unconditional love. Maybe it's environments like the sea or the uh, or nature, the mountains, the bush. We really want to be involved with that caring and kindness. So person is good, animals, something that we can feel as we, we can even put a hand on the heart, you can put one of your hands on your heart just to heighten that sense and that awareness. And as we think about, dwell into those feelings and sensations of caring and kindness, again, there's a part of us that begins to start aligning with that and connecting with that. That also makes it quite easy we don't have to have this huge discipline to quiet and shut down our mind. Just dwell and keep that gentle focus on the feelings of warmth and kindness and caring and love. Breathing quietly, smiling gently. So we're going to have a little bit of sound. The sound is also a continuous, ongoing sound. They've used that in the monasteries for thousands of years. And it also tends to be calming, centering. So it's the quietness that's important. It's the stillness, the centering, the quietness, the holding of our attention. So we don't have a lot of time now, but uh, what we would want to do is spend a, a short while with that focus on the warmth and the caring and the kindness and the friendliness, compassion, and then gradually start to let that go. So let it dissolve. Let those feelings and images and thoughts and sensations sort of dissolve and go away, dissolve, melt back into the background. And we want you to find just quietness and stillness. So also due to the time restrictions, I'll just be say about a minute. I'll keep quiet and play the bowls for a minute. Then we'll finish. Let's, let's put our hands together um, just for a few moments 
And that, of course, is another gesture that's found throughout the world as a gesture of, of reverence or greeting, or thanking, thank you. And uh, it also, just in front of our heart, uh, the electromagnetic heart in the center of the chest, so very telling and relevant, connects the energy from the left and the right side of the body together, fuses into a, a sense of harmony and balance in our heart. So I hope we all experienced a, a little moment of quietness and uh, we can of course take that a little bit further if there's any questions. And uh, So apologies for going slightly over time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Paul. So, and thank you for everyone who has um, stuck with us because we've gone past the hour now. Um, but being Paul and I, we like to share. And uh, what I'm going to do now is just open it to questions. So you've got the choice of uh, either putting a question in the chat box or just unmuting yourself and, and asking. Um, I'm going to start with just responding to somebody who um, wrote a message to me earlier. She said uh, she's a massage therapist um, and she wrote a blog, blog about immunity and she was wondering, could immunity in a very active sports person be heightened by doing a relaxation session? And the answer is yes, absolutely yes. It's that kind of yin yang relationship again. The more you put yourself out on the yang side or the hard, um, unforgiving side, almost uh, some athletes, I'm an ex athlete, so I know the, I know, I know the drill. Um, yeah, you push yourself very hard. The more you can do to balance that out with the, the yin side, the better. So, yes, massage therapy is great, but you need to figure out what your client needs at the time because uh, a hard sports massage when they've just done hard exercise could even heighten cortisol sometimes they just need something very calming to the nervous system okay any other questions i think we must have answered everyone paul already what do you think no would be coming through. Yeah. All right. So I'll just give it give a minute. Um, and thanks to everyone who's joined. I think I'll I'll just kind of wrap up a little bit. Um, you can see that immunity immunity is one aspect of health. Health is multifactorial, but immune the immune system is something you can pick out physiologically. You can measure it. You can get it on blood tests. But the human physiology is an interaction between the, the mind and the body. So we're very uh, complex beings, shall we say, and we interact, as Paul said, with everything around us. So we can't just say, okay, right, let's do a, a very concise research study. Let's give some people some vitamin C and other people don't give them any vitamin C and see what happens to their white blood cells. Um, that you'd have to control very carefully and make sure there's no other variables that come in. But you might have somebody who's in a very loving relationship, uh, who spends a lot of time in nature, and that'll be a lot more effective to the immunity the, than vitamin C. Whereas you get somebody who's on a high vitamin dose, who can get access to nature, might be living in an inner city, somewhere they don't like, they don't have any close relationships, or even worse, they're in abusive relationships. So relationships that, you know, love is definitely a nice take home from, from Paul there, amongst other things, are really, really important to the immunity. But also don't be complacent with what you're eating and your exercise. It's a conglomeration of everything that we call in functional medicine an input to the body. Anything that interacts with our body is an input. Okay, any questions? Okay, right, Claire. Um, 
In a nurturing environment, immunity can improve within days. How long from a nutritional perspective does it take to increase immunity? Um, Claire, I haven't um, read anything specific to time scales, but I mean, within research studies, research studies would generally be a number of weeks long to keep them practical. So it might be like a month or two that you generally see interventions over. Um, so yeah, we could definitely say within say a month of doing a nutritional intervention that uh, immunity is improved from a research perspective. But from an antidotal perspective, uh, if I made a very big conscious effort with a client today, within two, three days, um, you'd have an upturn of immunity. There's even, I'm trying to remember now, research that I've read where they look at like live blood analysis type studies and they can actually see changes in lymphocytes and macrophages kind of as they, they're watching. Uh, like um, Qigong, uh, Paul's area, Tai Chi, Qigong can have, actually have a transient effect on the immunity straight away. So yeah, nutrition, I don't have the direct information, but in ours, you can start changing. Um, okay, what else? Uh, from Jeffrey, on a fairly good diet, is it necessary to still be on supplements? I take omega-3, vitamin C, vitamin B, and moringa. Okay, so it's a nice combination. You know, it's that perspective thing. Uh, probably I'll change that word to context. You know, what's the context of your life? You can be eating really, really well and be in healthy relationships, but have a lot of stress or be or just be working really hard and maybe not sleeping enough um, maybe using hard exercise as a stress management um, and then i would say yes uh, let's keep throwing in the the supplements but make sure it's good quality um, and if you've got access to my book wholesome nutrition uh, i wrote a whole chapter on supplementation so in an ideal sense we don't need supplements but in reality there's a lot of stress Stress is a big depleter to nutrition. Um, and also so is toxicity. So the environments that a lot of us live in at the moment, especially Johannesburg as an example. Um, okay. Okay, we've got Gabby asking, Paul, where is your yoga studio based? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, the actual yoga studio is in uh, Yuxcape Park which is close to Douglas Dale and Olive Dale in between. But uh, we are focusing quite a lot online. So I teach privately and uh, there are also some public classes. So if you are interested, uh, you can just contact me separately. And uh, we've got some Zoom classes going as well. From next week, we're actually going to start a little bit of some private students. So we'll see what happens next week. Um, I've just left some contact details up there. Um, okay, great. So we love feedback. We, we really do love feedback. So let us know what you've enjoyed or any, any room for improvement um, or any other subjects you'd like uh, to maybe hear of. As I said, this was the first Nutritional Institute um, webinar combined with Sacred, Sacred Spiral, which is uh, Paul's yoga um, company. And yeah, there's capacity to put on all sorts of uh, webinars uh, because I think it's quite important to, to share and there's lots of different subjects we could look at. Uh, okay, Alison, where can you get my book in the UK? Well, recently you could have got it on Amazon, but they seem to have run out of the physical copy. Um, so you can now get Kindle, but not the physical copy. Um, yeah, you can ask me in a few months when I'm over in the UK and uh, hopefully I can get some copies. Okay, so anything you want to add, Paul, before we finish off? I, I'm pretty good. Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you everybody for joining. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah, and we will, um, we will share the recording link. We'll put this up on YouTube. Mm. And also we'll send out a PDF of the slides as well, just uh, if you want to kind of refer back and have a look. Okay.
So Lovely. thanks everyone for joining us and uh, keep well and happy immunity. <laughs> Had to finish with that. Well, lovely. Super. Okay.